Um, so our first speaker um, is Patrick Horn, and um, his, the title of his paper is Validating an Emotional Feedback Tool for Architecture, Investigating the Conditioning Imparted by Instructed Emotional Assessment in a Virtual Environment. Okay, Patrick, uh, Patrick is actually, uh, I know Patrick, uh, and he's actually doing his RIBA part three exam right now. <laughs> so he pre-recorded his presentation and I'll play this now. Hello, my name is Patrick Horn, and I'll be discussing my paper titled Validating an Emotional Feedback Tool for Architecture, Investigating the Conditioning Imparted by Instructed Emotional Assessment in a Virtual Environment. Unfortunately, I cannot present live today as I'm currently undertaking my professional architecture examination. However, I will be listening in throughout the day where I can, and look forward to listening to all of your presentations. I'm presenting another paper tomorrow that hopefully I'll be able to do in person. If any of you watch both presentations, then you'll see there's a certain amount of overlap between both. So hopefully I can answer any questions that you might have for both tomorrow. My predominant research interest is in the intersection of architecture and environmental psychology. My research explores new methods of testing how we experience environments and investigating how this can inform design in a realistic, applicable way. I work as an architect and I see this research as the development of a functional tool for architectural practice. Within this presentation, I will firstly introduce the key research themes for the paper, then briefly outline the paper's central hypothesis and discuss its results. Phenomenology might be best described as our lived experience. As architects, it is our job to contemplate this and shape the way our buildings make their inhabitants feel. However, within architecture, phenomenology is a term generally reserved for architects such as Peter Zumthor, who are seen by the rest of us as having the luxury of time and money to consider this within their designs. On the other hand, all architects like to think they know how a space will feel. When setting a ceiling height or selecting finishes, we like to believe that we know the effect of this. We see this as an inherent skill of the profession, learnt through experience, rather than a quantifiable metric. The field of environmental psychology studies how spaces make us feel. It studies architectural phenomenology. Yet, in most research institutions, this is an entirely separate discipline to architecture. When this research began a few years ago, I was studying at the Barla School of Architecture. And both of the heads of the thesis programme didn't even know what environmental psychology was. The problem with environmental psychology thus far has been that because our experience of space is so complex, it has been impossible to collect any truly applicable data for architectural design. Furthermore, the commercial pressures of architectural practice leave little space or time for this research. However, research within other fields has now greatly enhanced our understanding of our spatial cognition and our perception of space. Neurological researchers have sought to understand how space affects us, and this has given the field of environmental psychology quantifiable data to use. As architects, I believe we need to acknowledge this change. Virtual reality is a more powerful tool than most people realise. It has been proven that virtual environments, when seen through a headset, psychologically affect us in a very similar manner to physical environments. This is because our cognition of space is hugely dominated by visual stimuli. When our brain begins to embrace virtual environments, and we navigate around them as in reality, the same neurons begin to fire. That's not to say this is identical, I am by no means a neuroscientist, but we now have a tool to place participants within a simulation of a building and see how they respond. Considering the inevitable advancement of this technology, it would be foolish to expect anything other than near perfect fidelity within a short period of time, and very few architects are embracing this. So what can you get from this? 
I'm not suggesting architects become neuroscientists, but we need to develop practical methods of collecting data on how people respond to environments. But what can we collect? One thing we can collect is data on participants' emotion. Measuring emotion is a complex, much debated topic, and not one that as an architect I'm necessarily best placed to join in with. However, as a designer, if I can see how someone feels within my design, then this is an invaluable tool. Fortunately, one of the best ways to judge how someone feels is to ask them. With my other paper I'll be discussing tomorrow, I'll be elaborating on more sophisticated methods of data collection. However, for this paper the process is simple. We place someone in a virtual simulation of a proposed building, ask them how they feel, and then use this data. So what are the issues with this? Well, for one, asking someone how they feel is not a simple question. The very nature of asking someone a question can condition their answer. For example, it's been proven that asking someone if they're going to buy a car in the next three years makes it 40% more likely to happen. If an architect within an architectural studio shows someone a design and asks them how they feel, are they really going to provide a totally honest, unconditioned answer? So, I'm sorry it's taken a while to reach this point, but this is the specific focus of this paper. Can we quantify the conditioning imparted by an architect when asking an inhabitant within virtual reality how they feel? If so, then we can seek to factor this into the results collected. Therefore, the paper's key hypothesis is this. When verbally instructed to self-assess their emotional response to a virtual environment, participants are conditioned to feel pleasure. Pleasure was chosen, as it is a binary, fundamental measure of emotion. Any experience can be defined in some capacity on a scale of pleasure. The experiment was set up at the Bartlett School of Architecture, where participants were placed into a virtual environment while they recorded their emotional arousal through electrical skin conductance. I should emphasise that pleasure and emotional arousal are not identical. However, for the limited extents of this test, I felt that when combined with a binary reading of valence, it was a more appropriate, understandable measurements for participants. Again, I elaborate upon this decision further within the paper. Participants were placed into this virtual environment, allowed to explore for 10 seconds before being asked, how do you feel within this environment? A control group undertook the same test, but were not asked to assess how they felt. The emotional arousal of both groups was collected to assess what impact, if any, the verbal instruction to assess their emotion had upon their response. The environment shown here was from a parallel design project that I was undertaking at the time. No information was given to the participants about it, and it was left purposefully unfurnished and free of identifiable details, so the function of it did not impart specific connotations within the participants. The mean skin conductance levels from each group of participants were then compared to analyse the conditioning imparted. Unfortunately, the results did not demonstrate a clear correlation. However, they did highlight flaws within the testing process. The data obtained by skin conductance analysis gave baseline measurements for each participant that varied so much it undermined any correlation found. The study would therefore have to measure a much larger body of participants to reduce the standard deviation enough to provide valid results it was decided to not test change in emotional arousal before and after the question was asked, as I felt the experience of the virtual environment may, to those with less prior experience, have augmented the results. In hindsight, this may have had less of an impact. Had the baseline measurement within each participant been recorded, it could also have been used to rectify the variation of participants' results. However, the post-experiment questionnaire suggested that the participants themselves felt the question did alter their feelings of pleasure. 
and there is no reason, if the experiment was altered, that the hypothesis could not be found true. In any case, the experiment would have to be undertaken on a much larger sample group to provide data that could be practically used to correct information collected within this architectural testing process. To conclude, advancements in cognitive neuroscience now allow us to understand the way environments psychologically affect us. Whilst us architects are not going to become neuroscientists, to remain relevant, it is essential that we begin to use such data to inform our designs. This paper proposes an alternative, simple and practical methodology for this that can be employed within architectural studios immediately. Specifically, the paper focuses on quantifying the conditioning imparted within this process to see if this can be factored into results collected. Whilst unfortunately the results collected were not definitive, hopefully this paper has raised points of interest for future research. Thank you so much for listening, and I apologise again that I couldn't present this paper live today. Put some of the paper's key references on the screen. As mentioned, I'll be giving a longer live presentation on another paper tomorrow which analyzes this proposed testing methodology from a wider perspective, exploring how data can be collected and applied in various ways. I hope you can all listen to that as well and hopefully have some questions. My email address is below, so please contact me if you have any further questions or are interested in conducting any future research in this field. Thank you.